name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love the way that Luke writes. In one way, he is setting time in his gospel lesson. Because you have to see the calendar is all centered upon Christ. It has not yet been set. And so how do you tell time when there are no years to speak of? Well, you set time by who is in power, who is in charge. And so it's the 15th year of the emperor Tiber Tiberius. And this is how Luke sets time. But it's also how he talks about the irony of God's actions, the unexpected nature of what God is doing. Because God didn't come and give a word to the emperor Tiberius. He's the most important human on the planet. He is the one with power and prestige. He's the one that can give command. He is the one that has control of the government. And therefore, he can set all things right and bring peace and prosperity, right? God does not give a word to Tiberius. And Pontius Pilate is Tiberius' governor, and he is over Israel. And surely he is the one that is in place, standing between Rome and Israel, to set all things right with God's people. And God does not speak to Pontius Pilate. And what about Herod? He is, after all, king of Israel. Well, kind of a king. He is... Uh, uh, inherited his father's throne, a throne that his father earned by putting down a rebellion that was in that area. And so he is what's called a tetrarch, or a fourth of a king. <laughs> and so his family member, Philip, his brother, they kind of divide uh, a portion, two-fourths of the kingdom. Sanius is ruler of Abilene. They have all these names. Well, what about the priests? Surely God would speak to the priests, to Annas and to Caiaphas, his mouthpieces on earth. But he doesn't speak to them. Who does he speak to? He does speak to somebody who is a descendant of Levi, a descendant of Moses, someone of the high priest's family, someone who has been out in the wilderness wearing camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, long hair, stinky, just imagine the sight of John the Baptist. What an unlikely character. Imagine if somebody came in the door of this place, stinking to high heaven, has been eating locusts and honey, probably skin and bones, and he comes in here and he proclaims the message of John the Baptist. Make straight the way of the Lord. The one who is coming, as in the words of Isaiah, with a refiner's fire to purify the house of Levi. So, why this word, make straight the way of the Lord? Well, 
we actually have good visual imagery about making straight the way of the Lord around here because it seems that road construction is never ending. <laughs> this is a time in Israel, this is a time in Rome, where the world is being connected as it has never been connected before. Highways are being made to transport troops and to transport the goods and supplies that troops need. After all, an army travels on its stomach. And also to bring back all the wealth that conquest brings with it. Rome has now connected the world together with its roads. And this is critical for what God is doing in this chapter. For now we have communications that go with a speed that they have never gone before. Now it's hard to think about in our day and age when somebody can do something and it's got a million hits before the morning is out. But in this day and age, sometimes it would take weeks or months for news to get around. But not so in Rome, because now we have roads, now we have safe ways to travel, now there are straight highways. The low places have been filled in, the high places have been beaten low. There is a way for the messages to come through. And people have seen this. And John calls attention to this. And he hearkens back to the words of the prophet Isaiah. Make straight the ways of the Lord. The time is right. The roads are there. But what about the valleys and the hills that are in your heart? How treacherous is it for God to navigate? For God to come into that place that is at the center of your being? Is it ready for him? Or is he going to have to come in and do some major construction as he breaks into your being. You know, when I was in Tennessee, they were doing road work. And in South Central Tennessee, there's a lot of filling in and a lot of bringing down that has to happen. And there'd be signs up on the road warning you not to use your cell phones because blasting was happening in that place. They were using dynamite to detonate or to bring down hillsides so that they could make better, straighter, faster roads. Well, sometimes I feel like dynamite is what is necessary to break down some of the high points in our heart. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm feeling really good about myself, God gives me a swift kick, blows up that mountain peak that I'm on, and all of a sudden I remember, I am not all that there is. And what a gift that is. But in this season of Advent, I'm also reminded of the low spots that need filling in. This time of the year helps us to remember that. In fact, it keeps those low spots so intently before us that we can't help but notice them. The days are short. The nights are long. Darkness is in the land. And we yearn for the lengthening of days. 
And it's not just darkness that is in the land. But when we have these dark days, it reminds us of the darkness of our hearts, of the sadness, of the longing. And we want that expectation. We want that hope. We want to be called out of our darkness and into something more substantial, to something brighter, to something enduring and joyful. We need God to help us to fill the low spots in our hearts. And this, too, is part of preparing for the good news of the birth of Christ. Jesus is coming, and he is coming to be like a refiner's fire. Now think about that. Do you guys know what the process of refining gold and silver looks like? It's a furnace. It's a crucible. It is a hot, purging fire. And that is the image that Isaiah is using to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And it indicates the pain that Israel would have to go through as they are preparing for this new thing to happen. As they are preparing for the Messiah to bring in a new creation, they are going through the birth pangs. The time of expectation, the time of preparation, and how wonderfully that is symbolized in the pregnancy of Mary. I can imagine at this time that Mary is waking, making her way to the place that she is called to for the census. Great with child, riding on a donkey ready to start a new life. Little does she know the new life that she is bringing into the world is life for all of Israel. And through Israel for all of us. For the child she carries is the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken to Abraham so many years before that a blessing would come through Israel and that the descendants of Abraham would outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore and the stars in the heaven. And we are that grain. And we are those stars. So I implore each and every one of us to attend to our hearts To surrender to God's road building, to make the high places low and fill in the low places, to make straight a highway for our God who is coming so that we can joyfully greet him on Christmas morning. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.